So my name is Mark, and I am one of the, uh, uh, like the leaders here at Forward City Church, and so I'm just glad to share with you what God says. But my first question to you as the kids are kind of moving, I want to ask, you don't have to raise your hand at this one, but have you ever been bullied before? Like, I don't know about your story, but have you ever been bullied? Um, most kids, you know, we, we get teased, you know, we tease you know, where you teased by siblings, by friends. You know, at some point, it's kind of a mutual thing. We kind of laugh together. We kind of joke around together. It's kind of playful. It's, it's funny. It's, it's, it's in a mutual way, but sometimes it gets over the line, right? And you've been there, right? I've been there. It, it gets over the line, and it becomes less funny because it becomes hurtful. It becomes mean-spirited. It becomes constant, and sometimes it just crosses the line in our lives. And if you've been bullied, maybe some of you have actually been the bully in a situation. I don't know your story. I just know mine, and um, when I was in the eighth grade, I had pretty much had no bullies around me, like as far as there were bullies around me, but I never really struggled by being bullied. I mean, maybe there were at times, maybe I crossed the line with other people, but I had never really been bullied, and it was in the eighth grade, and it was really um, interesting because um, there was this guy named Rick Stahl. I remember him to this moment. Um, it's interesting because he is a, just a, just a, was a regular guy, he's just huge, he was just massively built up um, and worked out a lot and did stuff, and I was like 110 pounds in eighth grade, so um, I was just a small guy, and um, he, for whatever reason, took to me as his victim. And it's interesting, when you talk about bullying, you know what bullying can do, right? Like, they're, they're, they, it can start with shunning, you know, it, it, it can go from there to, you know, someone spreading rumors about you, it can go to, uh, um, to areas of... Um, you know, someone being mean-spirited, it can move into violence, it can move into extortion, you know, property damage, you know, kind of give me this and I'll take that from you. And, and we know the consequences of bullying from time to time. Not everybody faces this, but if you've been bullied and you remember, um, even as a, as a kid, you can sometimes still kind of wear some of the struggles of being bullied. I mean, again, I don't know your story, I just know mine, and sometimes the struggle that we can have because of that, um, it can lead to... Um, you know, issues with school, it can lead to issues with, uh, within our social circles, it can lead to issues at work. And, and for some of you, because you were bullied, it made the bus stop or recess really, really tense. It, it, made, it made those areas of your life like super difficult. And when you were to go in there, you would struggle going there because you knew that person was going to be there or you knew they were going to say this. For some of you, you can't look at Facebook, you can't look at some of the social media because there's someone that is bullying online to you. For some people, um, you have neighbors that it just you, you struggle going home sometimes because if your neighbor's out, you just know it's not going to be good. I, I remember this guy again, Rick. Um, like I don't really know why he started to come at me. I don't know why I became his victim. I don't understand it necessarily. Maybe I said something stupid. I, I get it. I probably did. I probably said something that was I was thinking was funny, but he didn't think it was funny. But for whatever reason, I became his victim and. Um, it, it started with just insults, and then it moved from there to threats. It, it moved uh, on, and, and he wasn't just talk. You know, some of people who are just bullies, and they're just all talk. He wasn't all talk. He was actually someone who actually did beat people up, and so I thought, great, why me? Um, so for about a month um, in kind of the last semester of my eighth grade year, I remember um, going to school early, and uh, getting on my bike, getting there early, getting to class earlier, kind of getting around where I was kind of safe first. <laughs> hey! Just a little bit. Hey, Ben. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's bullying me. No, um, I, I remember for that month, it was really stressful because I struggled with, do I go to school early? I, I, I left school um, early. I got to my, as soon as school was done, I just got on my bike and I went away. And this was about, for about a month and it was really, really stressful. And then the worst possible thing could have happened um, because I'd avoided him for about a month. But really the, the worst possible thing could happen to me, I actually got the same class as him in semester of our second semester of my eighth grade year. So what happened was our classes switched up and we had like had separate classes. So I just knew where I was. I knew where he was and I was able to get away quickly. But this last, this, this, this first day of the last semester, I go to my science class and Rick is in that class. 
And so I knew that as soon as I leave, he would leave with me, and I knew this was going to be the day um, that uh, I was going to get beat up. I couldn't avoid him any longer. And um, I didn't have cell phones back then, so there's no cell phones. You, could just, you couldn't fake an illness and then call your parents to pick you up. You remember some, some of you are old enough to remember that there's life without cell phones. Um, and it was that day I didn't know what to do. And I mean, again, it seems trivial maybe to me now or maybe trivial to you, but if you've ever been in that situation where you knew that today was the day and you had no way out. And I was there, and I remember that day, and it was, a, it was probably one of the worst moments of my life. And we'll get to that in a second, but in the summer, what we typically try to do, if you're new to Forward City, what we typically try to do is we, we take a break from some of the things that we've done, and we just try to hit on some of the stories of the Old Testament, some of the stories of the Bible and the New Testament, the, you know, character studies, people. Just, just remember us back to the old stories and learn some new things from them. And um, we decided to do that today, and we're going to start in the Old Testament and we're going to talk about a guy named Gideon. Now, the story of Gideon, if you've never read this before, maybe you have read it before, the story of Gideon reads like an action movie. Like, this is a really cool movie. If you were to watch this, you would probably, you know, we would probably pay to watch this. A lot of movies are kind of built after this concept. You have this guy who's an unlikely hero, like, raises to a challenge against all odds to accomplish what everyone else thought was impossible. There's an impossible task. There is a task that nobody can do, and there needs to be a hero, and there's not this person or that person, and some person who comes up who no one would thought, no one would have thought could do anything about it, gets raised up to save the day. And it's interesting, because when you read the Old Testament, sometimes it's hard because we compare ourselves to people. Have you ever compared yourself to people who do things for God? You think to yourself, oh man, I could never do that, or I could never do this, or, or because they're more talented, or I'm not smart enough, I didn't go to school, or, or whatever it is, we use a lot of excuses, and we sit back and think, I can't do that, because obviously God would use them, because they're just this, and I'm just kind of this. I'm not a natural leader. I'm not good at that. I love this story, because... Gideon is an example how God can use unlikely people to do and accomplish extraordinary things. How God can use person, a person who just doesn't think that they're worth anything to actually accomplish the impossible. And this is the story of Gideon. We pay to see that. And now the backstory is the land, of, the land that they were in was promised to Abraham. And God said that you're going to have a land. I'm going to have this land promised to you. And so they finally occupied this land. And it was a land filled with just like it was amazing blessings in this land. And, and at that point, there was no like, there was no rulers. There was no federal government that wasn't led by like kings at that point. Israel was basically a, a loose form of confederated tribes that kind of held together by a common lineage. And at that point, the term judge, as you read about the book of Judges where this is found, it's not used as a judicial term, but, but primarily as someone who kind of came along as like, a, as, as like a warrior, as someone who came along to raise up a military to help out in times of need. Now, what happened was basically before they entered this land that God had promised to them, They'd wandered around searching for a space, and God said, I have a space for you. And then so when they finally entered the land, God gave them a couple of conditions, he said to them, you know what, okay, listen, I, I, I've rescued you. I've brought you out of slavery. You have seen all the work that I've done. You have seen that I'm the real thing. And so what I ask of you is this. I'm going to give you things that you just can't comprehend how awesome they are. But what I ask you to do, just follow me. Like what I'm asking you to do, okay, there's, there's nothing huge, there's nothing major, because again, actually, not only, not only am I asking you to follow me, I'm going to give you a blessing. If you follow me, I'm actually going to bless you. I'm going to bless your crops, I'm going to bless your relationships, I'm going to bless, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to care for you. If you follow me, I'm going to do this for you. But if you don't, there's consequences to that. Like if you choose other gods, if you choose other things, when, 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 when things start hitting the fan, I'm going to let you lean into what you were leaning into, and I'm going to pull back a little bit. He says, but I'm going to give you so much. All I ask, just follow me. And what we see happen in the book of Judges is that the people did follow God. But when things were easy, they forgot him. 
It was a beautiful cycle. It was this, when things were tough, they remembered God and called out to God. But then things got, things got really easy when, when God came and blessed them. It was like, oh, we forget about God. We'll, we'll, we'll put God away for a little bit and only bring him out when we need him. He's like, you know, break glass if you have problems. He's like the fire extinguisher. He's the, he's the fire alarm. He's 911. The rest of my life, I don't need him. But right now, when I really need him, I really need him. We know people like that who lean into God only in times like that. Like, we all do that. And so what happened was when there would be this, things were going well, and then all of a sudden that things would, they, they, would, they, they would receive the punishment of, the, of their own actions, the consequences of forgetting God and walking after horrible things. And then what would happen is they would become oppressed by other nations. And then it would be hard for a period of time, and then they would, they would move back into a time of, of, of calling out to God, God, we need you, help us, please. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll never do it again. We will never forget you again. We were mistaken. We were following God. You can't actually help us, but you can help us. So then they would lean into God again, and then God would raise up a judge. He would raise up a victor, someone who would bring victory and, 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 and healing and draw them back to himself. And then things would go well for a little while, and then they would forget God again and then enter a cycle. And so what was happening at this moment, they were in another bottom end of a cycle. And then Judges chapter 6, this is what it says. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So, so, so the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. So basically, hey, listen, if you're not going to follow me, here are the consequences of your actions. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the peoples of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking the sheep and goats and cattle and donkeys. And these enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. And they arrived in droves of camels, too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So this basically wasn't a formal occupation. What was happening is these people were using, they were bullying them hard. So what would happen is they would let the Israelites do all the hard work. They would plant the grain. They would, they, they would do everything. They would raise the sheep and the cattle. And then what would happen is when harvest time came, they came and took it. So they would come and they would get all, and it'd be a beautiful harvest and everything would be super awesome. And then the hoarders would come and the marauders would come and then they'd have to run away with a few things they could grab in the last minute. And then they would just take all the things that they didn't plant and they would just ravage the land and then just leave and then the cycle would repeat itself. The Bible says that so Israel was reduced to starvation because they couldn't really feed their own families. And then it says, then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. See, every harvest time, every time that they would have bounty, every time blessing would seem to come, they had to run away. So they began to call out to the Lord who they had forgotten in the past. It says, when they cried out to the Lord, the Lord, to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to Israel and he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from those who oppress you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites or those in the land you live now. But you have not listened to me. And so God comes to him through, through a prophet and he says, guys, listen, I know what's going on. And, and this is what's happened. It wasn't me that left you. You, you left me. He says, my care, my, my provision, my protection, my abundance, my blessing, my love was always there. It's always been here. But the reason you're in this situation is it's because of you. It's, it's because you didn't listen. It's because you didn't live out my commands. You didn't live out and operate in my character because you were busy chasing other gods chasing greed and selfishness and sin. So the reason why you're facing what you're facing isn't because I left you. It's because you left me. See, we're really quick to blame God for things, aren't we? Like you're really quick. I'm really quick to blame God. Well, this isn't going right. It must be God's fault. Well, where, where was God in our lives and how real was he in our lives before that happened? See, what God is saying here is, is 
you know, I, I love this part of the story is because God could have just said, you know what, I'm done with you. This is like a, this is, this has been a couple of cycles here. I am done. I'm going to wash my hands. You know what? This is your bed. You made it. You live it. And I'm going to walk away. And you know what? Forget it. I'm done. I'm out. But we're going to see that even though the Israelites turned from him again and again, God never turned from them. And what we're going to learn over the next couple of weeks is, is, is that, that, that his love, in his love and his faithfulness, God is preparing someone that will come bring freedom and will turn their hearts back to him. Now, this is the beautiful story. It's an epic story. And I, and I love that God preserved this history for us because it has some incredible applications for us today. And we're just going to end here really quickly. See, and the, the, the application here is interesting for us as we read this and think, well, why are we talking about an Old Testament person? And we get that this is Old Testament. This is, this is a long time ago. We get it. But the amazing application, there are things here that we can draw from this for our own lives. And we're not under attack by an invading army. I get it. But we do live in a culture that has forgotten God. Like we live in a culture that, that, that really has turned its back on God. A culture that doesn't readily live out the values of God, doesn't live out his character. A culture that doesn't love God with all their hearts and a culture that doesn't love their neighbor as their self. We, we, we get this. Now, it's not that we're starving and having to run into caves, I understand, but yet we still live in a culture that is broken. And it's broken because our culture, we chase other gods. It may not be the gods of the Amorites or the gods of the Hittites or whatever in the Old Testament, but it's the gods of greed and the gods of selfishness. I mean, there's so many other things that we chase instead of God. And as a result, we see brokenness. See, the result of that whole aspect, they were, they were being invaded and, and they, they saw the, the, the brokenness and the hurt and the things that that caused. We see the brokenness because a culture has turned their backs on God. A few months ago, we, uh, um, we asked, we, we, we talked about just, just kind of labeling and seeing the brokenness that we see. And we had that whiteboard. If you remember that, it's still online. You can see it. But we actually just said, we actually just shout out, what are, what are some of the things that you see? What are, what are some of the areas of brokenness, some of the areas that make you mad, some of the areas that just, just, just get you upset about? And some of the things that you guys said and shouted out, we wrote down was well, the loss of faith, the, the, the addiction problems that we see. Things that bother you were things like poverty and, 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 and poverty that can actually be addressed if we gave it time and energy. What bothered you was homelessness and exploitation. What bothered you was broken marriages. What, what bothered you was families in need. The lack of affordable housing, the lack of guidance for our children, the, 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 the reality that we live so, with so many people around us and yet we are so incredibly lonely. And what bothers you as well, and it bothers me, is that there are some people who are living so close to the line that it's just going to take one more issue, one more thing, and they're going to fall below the line, and they're going to be in some serious trouble. And I know when we wrote these things down, I don't know when I wrote it down, I was excited to know that you guys saw some of the same things I saw, but at the same time, my heart kind of sank a little bit. I don't know if yours did. And we see that thing listed there, and man, I, I remember thinking to myself, oh, dang, that is heavy stuff. And I know we're excited about the possibility of doing some things. We're working through those things right now. But when I saw that, and I'm, I'm sure when you saw that, your heart sank a little bit because it's so big of an issue. Like homelessness, how, how do you fix that? Like, how do you fix broken marriage? How, how, how do you do that on a, on a large scale? How do you see some of these needs and actually do something about it? Like, how in the world can we make a difference? So what we do is instead of doing something about it, we are like, you know what, it's, this is too big. I can't really do anything. So we do what the rest of culture does and says, well, I'll leave that to someone else to do. 
We hope it changes. We, we, we pray that it'll change. But in the equation, we're not really fitting into it. I'm never going to forget that day in science class when um, we were uh, working to... Um, we were working on a project. It was like the first day. We are kind of getting to know some of the things around us, you know, beakers and things like that, Bunsen burners, which is pretty cool. Um, and so the teacher was doing his own thing, and uh, Rick was in a different section of the class, and he kind of walked over to me, and um, he let me know in no uncertain terms that this, today was the day. He said, he was gonna, today's the day I'm going to beat you up. Now, he didn't say it as nicely as that. Um, he didn't say it in a way that I could, you know, say it to you, um, but I knew, <laughs> I knew what he meant. He told me I couldn't hide this time. He told me that uh, there's no one going to help. He knew where my bike was, and uh, I couldn't get away fast. That today was the day that I had been dreading for months. And um, I don't know why, but in that moment, I, I, I just looked at him and I said, why? Like, wh why, why me? Like, I've seen you do this with other people, but, but, but why me? And I was a good talker. I could kind of talk my way out of stuff, but I tried before with him, and it wasn't going to work. And I said, just, just tell me, why me? And he said, because I don't like you, which is fine. A lot of people don't like me but don't want to beat me up, I think. He said, I don't like you. So I don't know what I did. I don't know why I did it. But in that moment, um, I looked him in the eye. And I told him, I said, if you don't like me, and you're going to beat me up because you don't like me, you're going to have to beat me up every single day because this is who I am, and I'm not going to change. Now, I don't know what came over me in the moment to say that. I'm not saying that this is what you need to do in the situation. I'm not saying that. Because he could have said, okay, every day. In fact, that's what he did say. But in that moment, I guess it was maybe just how I was fed up. In that moment, I was just completely fed up. I was tired of running. I mean, if I was going to get beat up, then fine. Let's just get it over with. I was done running. I was done hiding. I, was, I had enough of being scared. Now, I don't say this to make me look really brave because I was not. I probably need to change my underwear at that time. But I just came to the point where I, I didn't want to have to keep going through and see that hurt and that pain. I, I wasn't going to let that bully steal my life anymore. Now, what if I told you that as we read this over the course of the next couple of weeks, what if I told you that God wants to empower people to stand up, to stop letting Satan use these things around us to push us around and to continue to hurt us and those that we care about? Like, what if I told you that, that God wanted to raise up some people to, 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 actually, to, to actually come in and stop Satan from using addictions and, and hurt and worry and all those things to hurt people? Like, what if I told you, just for a moment, that, that God, through this, we're going to see that God actually wants to raise up champions to step into the brokenness with the hands and feet of Jesus. And what if I told you that I believe with all of my heart, and this isn't just me because I'm a pastor, I believe with all of my heart that God has positioned us as a church, that where we are today, that I believe with all of my heart that God wants to use you and me. So over the course of the next couple of weeks, we are going to learn through this story, through this epic, powerful story, is that God doesn't use necessarily all the time people who are super strong. God's not always looking for the strongest or the smartest or the most talented, which we often think he does. God's not looking for just the greatest leaders, the people with the most things, the most resources. God is really good at using regularly, overwhelmingly ordinary people like Gideon. And if God can use him, God is going to use us. 
This summer, my prayer is at the end of this, is that we as a family will come together in such a way that we will see some of the areas that we can step into with the power of Jesus. Not with our talents, not with our gifts, not with those things, but with the power of Jesus working in us. Because sooner or later, we need to stop and we need to say, it's enough. We're not going to be bullied or pushed around anymore. Sooner or later, we need to pick a fight. Sooner or later, we have to say it's enough. It's time for God to use you and me. So at the end of this, our prayer is that we have a team of people kind of working together to figure out some things that we can tangibly do to make even just a little dent. It's a, it, may, it may seem incredibly insignificant, but it's going to be a little dent. And we're going to help one person the way we wish we could help them all. We have opportunities for you to get involved in that. Because enough's enough. Enough's enough. Let's do something. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for us. And um, thank you that you use overwhelmingly ordinary people all the time to do extraordinary things. And God, as we're going to learn and we're going to see kind of principles and we're going to see kind of how you use people that, 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 no, that no one else would use for anything. But you're like, hey, man, that's exactly the person I'm looking for to make a difference. So, God, I'm super excited about what you're going to do through this, and you're going to challenge us, and you're going to encourage us, and you're going to send us, and, and we're going to see you do some really cool things in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our families. Thank you, God. Now, we are excited about today. We're excited about um, the opportunity for us to just kind of hang out a little bit after this and just spend time together and um, eat hot dogs, which are so good for us. God, thank you. Uh, and we're going to have Waterloo fights, and we're just going to hang out. So, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless this time that we have together, that you would um, encourage us and strengthen us as we um, spend time as a family. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the things that we do later on today. In Jesus' name.